Hello and welcome to the next instalment of Law & Order, the video series where I look at and unpack stories from games. In this one we'll be looking at Sucker Punch Productions action adventure game Ghost of Tsushima, featuring an absolutely beautiful open world, great game mechanics, an awesome story and one of the best sword combat systems in any game I've played, Ghost of Tsushima was an unforgettable experience. There's no word of a sequel yet, but hopefully we'll get some positive news soon. Please note that there will be major spoilers in this video for both the main campaign and the Icky Island DLC too. We'll begin the video with a brief explanation of the game's plot and unpack various details afterwards. This will be a pretty long video, so do feel free to use the chapters below to navigate it. Let's begin. It's 1274 in feudal era Japan. A fleet of the Mongol Empire, or rather the Mongols, have launched an invasion of Tsushima, a Japanese island belonging to the Japanese archipelago. The Mongols have essentially captured territory all over the island, and 80 samurai are making a desperate last stand on Komoda Beach. The Jito, or the Lord of Old Tsushima, Lord Shimura of Clan Shimura, sent his best and most skilled warrior, Haranobu Adachi of Clan Adachi, to challenge the Mongols' greatest fighter. The hope was that in besting the Mongols' greatest fighter, this would prevent a battle since the samurai were vastly outnumbered. Haranobu calls out their best fighter, but the Mongol leader throws oil onto Haranobu, sets him on fire, and then brutally beheads him. This act itself is an insult to the samurai code known as Bushido, their code of honour and morals. As a result, Lord Shimura orders all the samurai to storm the Mongols on the beach and to show absolutely no mercy. The game's protagonist, Lord Jin Sakai, Lord Shimura's nephew, along with the other samurai on horseback, battle the Mongols. Jin and Lord Shimura both spot the leader of the Mongols. Lord Shimura tells Jin that they will end it together. But that doesn't go well, as naval bombardment puts an end to their charge. Jin then wakes to find all the samurai dead, completely wiped out. He also spots Lord Shimura. He walks towards his uncle but takes an arrow in the back and passes out again. The Mongol leader approaches Lord Shimura and introduces himself as Khoten Khan, the cousin of Kublai Khan and the grandson of Genghis Khan. He, in no uncertain terms, tells Lord Shimura to surrender. Lord Shimura makes it clear that that's not going to happen, so Khoten seemingly executes Lord Shimura. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jin isn't dead, he's been rescued. Dragged from Komodo Beach, bandaged up, and his wounds tended to by someone. He has no idea how he got there, but he wakes and hears the sound of a village being attacked by Mongols. He investigates. He enters the village and finds his damaged armour, but his sword is not there. He sees someone getting killed by a Mongol soldier, and he meets the woman who saved his life. A woman called Yuna, who is a thief. Jin hides after a Mongol soldier comes in and beats Yuna, but while his back is turned, she kills him. Jin asks her who she is, and she introduces herself. Jin mentions that he is Lord Shimura's nephew, and Yuna is shocked, but she mentions that Lord Shimura may actually be alive, and that the Mongols took him as a prisoner. Jin assumes that they took him to a castle called Castle Canada. He wants to mount a rescue so Lord Shimura can contact the Shogun, which is the military leader and the samurai of all samurai, who can send reinforcements from the mainland. But Yuna talks him out of such a mission, saying that he's not ready for it yet. Yuna confesses that she couldn't leave Jin to die because she actually needs his help. After they sneak through the village, Yuna takes Jin to his sword. He swiftly kills a Mongol that discovered him and saves a man and his baby son. Yuna then elaborates on what she needs his help with. Her brother Taka, her only remaining family, was taken by the Mongols. Jin agrees to help her, but after he has saved his uncle. Yuna says that she'll go with him, and he and Yuna manage to get two horses and escape the village. They then ride to Castle Canada. Jin and Yuna fight their way through a large number of Mongols, until the point where Yuna says that they can't keep going or they'll both be killed. Jin tells Yuna to get the horses ready, and that if he's not back, to ride for the forest. Jin then comes to a bridge, and after defeating some more Mongols, he calls out Khoten Khan, who emerges from the castle. Lord Shimura is indeed alive. The two then fight one another. After a vicious duel, Jin slashes Khoten Khan, who throws Jin off the bridge and into the water below. Jin has a flashback to when he was younger, where he was powerless and fearful, and failing to intervene in order to save his father. He washes up onto the shore, hurt and ruses failure to save his uncle. He looks at his sword, which bears the symbol of his clan, Clan Sakai, and asks the spirit of his father how he can save Lord Shimura. All of a sudden, a strong wind comes out of nowhere. Jin follows the guiding wind, which leads him straight to Yuna. 
After hiding from some Mongol raiders, Jin says that before he can help Yuna save her brother Taka, they need some more allies in their fight against Khotan Khan and the liberation of Lord Shimura from captivity. The allies he needs are Yuna herself, Sensei Ishigawa, and Lady Masago Adachi. Yuna says that her brother is the best blacksmith on the island, and he will make whatever tool that Jin needs in order to save his uncle. Jin mentions that he could do with a tool to scale the walls of Castle Canada. Now, from this moment on, the game is open world, and players can do things in any order they wish, so the explanation of the plot may play out a little differently to your game. Jin later meets up with Yuna, and the two ride to a Mongol prison camp. They survey it, and Yuna suggests a stealthy approach, whereas Jin, abiding by the Bushido Code of Honor, would prefer to do it his way. With that dilemma in mind, they enter the prison camp. Jin agrees that if they're seen, then the Mongols will kill the prisoners, so Jin reluctantly assassinates the guards, going against his code of honor. They can't find any sign of Taka, but after releasing all the prisoners in the camp and escaping with one, they learn that a bunch of prisoners got taken to Asamo Bay, a small town surrounded by walls, and that a blacksmith was among them. They can go there, but they need a plan first. Yuna says that her brother will forge the item Jin needs, but after that, her and her brother are going to leave the island and move to the mainland. Jin wants her and Taka to stay and help them fight for their home. Jin goes to meet with Yuna in the Asamo prefecture, who is speaking to her friend, a sake brewer named Kenji. Yuna has a plan to hide her and Jin inside Kenji's sake cart and push it to Asamo Bay, a Trojan horse if you like. Being careful not to raise the alarm, Jin and Yuna sneak through the town. They see a slaver and decide to follow him in the hope that he will lead them to Taka. And he does. Yuna eliminates the slaver and is reunited with her brother. They escape Asamo Bay and meet up with Kenji. They ride out to a place called Archer's Rise, and Taka says he'll pay back Jin's act of freeing him by making him whatever he needs. Taka and Yuna leave for a place called Komatsu Forge. Jin later goes to Komatsu Forge and finds more Mongols there. He takes them out with the help of Yuna. Given that a Mongol army will not be far away, Yuna says that they should just leave, but Jin wants to stay and fight them, to take and to hold the land because they need the forge and its people. Jin speaks with Taka and Taka needs his assistant Yukio. The two got separated so, naturally, Jin is called into action once more. He finds Yukio being attacked by Mongols and takes them out. He also rescues Yukio's sister from more Mongols and sends the group back to Taka. Jin and Yuna then save a family who took in Taka at one point in his life. Returning to the forge, it appears the Mongols have now arrived and another fight ensues. Jin and Yuna are victorious. Taka is dumbfounded, claiming that he's never seen a samurai fight like Jin did. Yuna then makes a bold move. She says that Jin is actually a vengeful spirit, the ghost of a fallen samurai out for revenge against the Mongols in the hope that word will spread, putting fear into the Mongols themselves. Jin orders them to light the forge, and they get to work on forging weapons. Jin then goes to a place called Hayoshi Springs, hoping for information on where to find Sensei Ishikawa. A man tells Jin that he can find Ishigawa at his dojo on the top of the cliff. He goes there and finds the place has been attacked. Jin follows bloody footprints up to a house and there he finds Sensei Ishigawa, the legendary archer. Jin expresses his disappointment that Sensei Ishigawa didn't actually join the other samurai at Komoda Beach. Ishigawa states that he was actually on his way, but that he was attacked by bandits. Jin asks the Sensei for his help in saving Lord Shimura, but he states that he can't as he's looking for his student Tomoe, who has gone missing. They follow her tracks. On the way, Ishigawa says that Tomoe didn't come from a clan, but that she was a peasant. They also reminisce about the fact that Sensei Ishigawa rejected Jin as a student 20 years prior. Anyway, they eventually follow the tracks towards a small camp. They find a Japanese quiver, a gift from the Sensei to Tomoe, which concerns him. He says that Tomoe would never leave the quiver behind, prompting concern that she was pursued by Mongols. Sensei Ishigawa thinks that they have taken Tomoe to a nearby fort, Fort Nakayama and after gifting Jin with a new bow and surveying the fort, they attack with bow and arrows. With all the Mongols dead, Jin and Sensei Ishigawa find slain prisoners who had been tied up and slain with arrows. They find Japanese arrows which have been fired into a target. The Sensei confirms that they are actually Tomoe's arrows. They surmise that the Mongols, for some reason, allowed Tomoe to use a bow. They find a survivor who says that Tomoe was indeed there. She was a prisoner. Was being the operative word, as the Mongols let her out, gave her armor and a bow, and what's more, Tomoe killed the man's wife. Also, that the bodies that had been slain were slain by Tomoe, who was proving her skill to the Mongols. And finally, that they recruited her. And then Sensei Ishigawa reveals the truth. I demand an answer. She attacked me. Not bandits. Tomoe. 
Why? She has no idea what it means to be samurai. You drove her to the Mongols. Do not judge me. Do not lie to me. I can't let Tomoe teach my way of the bow to the enemy. And we will stop her. This is my fight. I don't need your weapon. No, you need me. Victory is won by warriors, not weapons. Lord Shimura raised you well. We'll hunt them away together, but we do it my way. And when the time comes, you will help rescue my uncle. You have my word, Sakai. So with Sensei Shikawa on side, Jin goes to find Lady Masako Adachi. He arrives at the estate of Clan Adachi. Jin finds assassins there and defeats them. He also investigates and finds signs of not only a struggle, but also of an escape, with the women of Clan Adachi having seemingly passed their children through the window. He finds the stables empty, signalling that someone took the horses, and that someone had chased them. Jin follows the tracks, finding a horse that belonged to Clan Adachi, and someone fires a warning shot at Jin, and it's Lady Masako. Jin breaks the news that her husband, Haranobu Adachi, was killed on Komoda Beach. After Jin asks for a clan's help in rescuing Lord Shimura, she replies by saying that Clan Adachi is dead, massacred by their own people. This includes the children of the clan, and Masako's sister, who is brutally beheaded by the perpetrators. Masako intends to find the people responsible, so naturally, Jin helps. They honour the dead. Lady Masako is obviously distraught that her entire clan and family is dead, but she agrees to aid Jin if he, in return, helps her avenge her family and hunt down their killers. They go to the Golden Temple, and Lady Masako tells Jin to seek out a monk called Sogun. Jin speaks with Sogun and informs him of Lady Masako's clan having been slaughtered by traitors. The monk says that Lady Masako is welcome to take refuge at the temple. Jin Ren speaks with Lady Masako, and she says that Sogun only offered that so her family's killers would know exactly where to find her. She reveals that Sogun visited her home just before the assassins did, and Lady Masako has figured in for a scout. They spot him leaving the temple and follow him to an inn, where he speaks with some assassins. Jin and Lady Masako take them out, and they confront Sogun. Sogun says something that really ticks Masako off though, and she flat out kills him. Jin searches the inn and finds a list of co-conspirators. Showing the list to Masako, she is shocked to discover a familiar symbol on it, a rival clan. Lady Masako agrees to assist Jin in freeing Lord Shimura. Finally, Jin is willing to turn to the Straw Hat Ronin, a rugged group of mercenaries that would be very handy against the Mongol army. Whilst out trying to find them, Jin comes across the remnants of a wrecked cart, part of a Mongol convoy which was ambushed. He assumes the Straw Hat Ronin to be the responsible party, so he follows the trail of dead Mongols and horses, and he eventually comes to a clearing where he finds a straw hat on the ground. A Mongol rushes in towards Jin, but he is saved by one of the straw hat, a man named Ryuzo. The two actually know one another. Friends from long ago, Jin tells Ryuzo that he's looking for the straw hat leader, but is met with the response that the leader died on Komoda Beach. Jin tells Ryuzo that he needs help in saving Lord Shimura. Ryuzo says that the Straw Hats are hurt and starving. Jin says that once they free Lord Shimura, he can pay them as much as they want. It seems that Ryuzo himself is now the leader of the Straw Hat Ronin. They hear Mongol horns and fight them, killing them all. Afterwards, Ryuzo says they can't help, as they're simply just too hungry and won't risk their lives to save one man. Jin and Ryuzo encounter a man whose cart was attacked by Mongols, who stole his rice, saying they took it to the nearby Fort Ohira. Jin puts to the Straw Hats a plan to raid the fort for food. Jin throws on some Ronin armour so that he can look the part. Ryuzo says that if they can get food from the fort, then the Straw Hat will help free Lord Shimura. Jin meets the Straw Hats at a cemetery, and they survey the fort. Jin sneaks through the fort and climbs a lighthouse, and lights a beacon, signalling the Straw Hats to attack. After taking out the Mongols in the fort, they look for food but find none. Not one scrap. They did find papers on a Mongol officer. Jin reads that all the food had been moved and loaded onto a nearby ship to be taken offshore. Jin suggests that they attack the ships in the bay. A plan is formulated and Ryuzo and Jin take a small boat and board the Mongol ship. Jin finds Mongol war plans that signal their intent to send 1,000 men to the Toyotama region. They fight their way through the ships but can't find a scrap of food. Jin shows Ryuzo the Mongol battle plans which have a map. Jin gives it to Ryuzo after he tells him that he can count on the Straw Hats helping to free Lord Shimura. Jin now has everything he needs in order to mount his rescue attempt at Castle Canada. He returns to Komatsu Forge and speaks with Yuna. She reveals that Jin has already started to become a legend, who the islanders call the Ghost, due to them genuinely believing that Jin Sakai is a vengeful samurai spirit. Jin speaks with Taka, who has the item ready. 
It's a grappling hook, which will help Jin to scale the walls of Castle Canada. Ryuzu then turns up. Turns out that some of his men, his best fighters, have been captured by the Mongols and taken to Fort Yatate. And of course, Jin needs their help in freeing Lord Shimura, so what's left of Ryuzu's men ride for the fort. Jin separates from the group and uses his new hook to climb up the cliffside, and he infiltrates the fort unnoticed. Jin takes out the Mongols in the fort and frees the Straw Hats who had been imprisoned. He then signals Ryuzo. The Straw Hats attack and they along with Jin kill the remaining Mongols, but Ryuzo says that something doesn't add up. The Mongols took his men but didn't hurt them, and they even fed them. Good food as well. A few hours later after he returned to Komatsu Forge, Jin arrives at Castle Canada. He's waiting for Ryuzo and his Straw Hats who haven't yet turned up as planned. Yuna arrives and they decide not to wait for the Straw Hats and continue on with their plan. Sensei Ishigawa and Lady Masako have arrived. Jin will infiltrate the castle using the grappling hook, will sound the alarm, prompting the others to breach the front gate. Then they'll enter the main keep and rescue Lord Shimura, then make their escape. One by one, Jin and his allies make their way through the Mongol guards. Eventually, Jin comes across Ryuzo, alone. Ryuzo. The Khan put a bounty on the ghost. Anyone can claim it. You wouldn't. My men are starving, Jin. Help me save my uncle, and he will reward your men. He will make you samurai. Then he will send us to die, just like he did at Komodo Beach. Yuzo, he's your family, Jin. I need to protect mine. The two fight one another, and Jin comes out victorious, but Ryuzo flees, leaving Jin to fight yet more Mongols. Jin climbs the keep in order to find and free Lord Shimura, and he manages to get to him. Lord Shimura reveals that Koten Khan has left. He has marched north to conquer Lord Shimura's castle, Castle Shimura. Their main focus now, though, is to retake Castle Canada. Jin, his allies, and Lord Shimura take out the remaining Mongols still at the castle. Two days later, Koten Khan and his army, along with the traitor Ryuzo, have arrived at Castle Shimura in the region of Toyotama. The Khan demands that they surrender and open the gate, and he offers them food and rest. He has taken prisoners and uses them as leverage. The Khan makes Ryuzo prove his loyalty by having him set fire to one of the prisoners, an act which visibly upsets him. Not wanting to kill another prisoner, Ryuzo screams at them to open the gate, and they do so. Back at Castle Canada, word has gotten to them that Castle Shimura has been taken. Jin speaks to Lord Shimura. Lord Shimura tells Jin that Koten Khan has told him about his exploits while he was imprisoned, about him abandoning the samurai code. Lord Shimura basically says, thanks for what you did, but stop. He tells him that he cannot continue down the path he is going on, as the whole island of Tsushima look to the samurai for guidance. Jin asks about Yuna and giving her safe passage to the mainland, to which Lord Shimura replies that he will grant passage once the seas are clear of Mongol ships, but on one condition that she helped retake Castle Shimura. After speaking with his allies, including a now very irate Yuna, Jin readies his horse. Jin and Lord Shimura ride to try to gather more allies in their fight to retake Castle Shimura. It's not long until they come across a village and lots of bodies that have been burned. Lord Shimura thinks it's the Khan's revenge for his escape. After another quick battle, Lord Shimura mentions that this is the work of the Khan's wolves, sent north to ravage the islanders. They ride up to the lighthouse at Fort Ito to slay the Mongols inside and light the beacon in the lighthouse to signal the Khan that they are coming for him. Yuna and Lord Shimura speak, and she mentions that Yarikawa has plenty of warriors. However, years earlier, Lord Shimura put an end to the Yarikawa rebellion, so they aren't really very fond of the samurai, or more particularly, Lord Shimura himself. Yuna knows this because she herself grew up in Yarikawa. If she can convince her people to fight under the banner of Lord Shimura, then she will earn her right to the mainland. Lord Shimura and Jin then light the beacon as a warning to Koten Khan. Lord Shimura tells Jin to ride to his home and to claim his father's old armour, the armour of Clan Sakai. Jin also needs to convince the peasants of Yarikawa to fight for their cause, and in the meantime Lord Shimura will petition the Shogun for reinforcements from the mainland. 
Lord Shimura has unsavory contacts of his own, so Jin needs to also go to seek out a pirate named Goro at Emugi Cove, who owes Lord Shimura a debt. Jin rides to meet with Yuna and Taka near the Yarikawa stronghold. It seems that the Mongols have surrounded the stronghold and no one can get in. The three of them ride to the walls of Yarikawa. Yuna points out a hidden entrance and they all use it to gain entrance into the stronghold. The Mongols are outside the gate and threaten to attack. Jin, Yuna, Taka and the Yarikawa steward go to meet with Lord Yarikawa, who isn't exactly pleased to see Jin. He clearly still harbours a grudge against Lord Shimura. Jin says that they will help repel the siege and in return, they will help Lord Shimura. He pretty much refuses, saying that Yarikawa will survive, and he walks away. Speaking with Taka, he has heard from the swordsmith that Yarikawa's best archers left to fight the Mongols, but they've been missing for days. They need those archers to repel the siege. So, Jin meets Yuna by the ruins of old Yarikawa. They follow some tracks to a house and are surprised by a bear. They find no trace of the archers in the house, but Yuna discovers a still warm fire and figures they must be close. More tracks lead them to the group of archers. They say the Mongols caught most of their group while the archers were raiding the Mongol camp for supplies. They need to go fast, as the Mongols are leaving the area soon. Jin, Yuna and the archers come out with a plan to ambush the Mongol convoy. After taking them all out, the archers leader, Daikoku, says that he'll make sure Lord Yarikawa helps Lord Shimura retake Castle Shimura. Back in Yarikawa, Jin speaks with Yuna at the top of the lighthouse. They drink sake and discuss the town's chances in defending against the Mongol siege. They discuss Yuna's mother, in that she was an abusive drunk. Then comes the time to defend against the siege. Waves and waves of Mongols come, a large scale battle takes place, but eventually the Mongols appear to retreat. But Jin thinks it's strange, as they barely did any damage. Then it's revealed that the Mongols are using siege weapons to try and destroy the town from a distance. Jin then takes them all out and runs back to the town. He fights his way back to the steward's keep, and he comes across one of the Mongol generals, Temuge. The two fight. Jin then adopts a ghost stance and strikes fear into the Mongols, causing them to flee for real. Yarikawa is safe. Jin delivers a rousing speech to the townsfolk, emboldening them should the Mongols try and return, and uniting them with the samurai in order to aid Lord Shimura. Meanwhile, word has gotten back to Koten Khan that one of his best generals is dead. He's talking to Ryuzo, who pretty much says that Jin is the best swordsman on the island, and that his straw hats killing Jin is pretty much impossible. The two decide to formulate a plan to get at Jin another way. It's now time for Jin to return home to Omi Village and the Sakai Estate. He is surprised by his family's caretaker, Yuriko. She says that apart from a few bandits, the estate has been unaffected by the Mongols. Jin says that he's looking for his father's armor. While Yuriko and another man, Taichi, get the armor, Jin visits his father's grave and reflects. He then goes to retrieve his father's armor. It's not long before some straw hats attack the estate, leading to Jin dealing with them. Jin asks Yuriko about some poisons that she's been making, and if she can make one strong enough to kill a man. Yuriko states that poisoning is not the Sakai way, but Jin needs every weapon he can use against the Mongols. Jin says a blowgun and darts will be laced with the poison, so Jin makes one. He returns later on to find Yuriko upset and crying, but the two then leave to find the poison. Yuriko uses some plants to craft the poison and teaches Jin how to craft it for himself. He then tests the poison out on a straw hat, which freaks his mates out and causes them to flee. After this, Yuriko crafts another type of poison which causes hallucinations, leading to possibilities of Mongol soldiers attacking their allies. The two ride to Shimura Cemetery, as Yuriko is enjoying the company. A little later though, Jin returns to Yuriko and finds her coughing. She's clearly not very well. She feels faint, so Jin goes to get her some food. He returns to find Yuriko gone. He tracks her horse and finds her collapsed. She claims to have seen her mother. She asks Jin to go with her to pay respects to her mother, and they go to Turtle Rock Shrine. Yuriko once again thinks she is talking to Jin's father. She mentions the death of Jin's mother. After looking out across Tsushima, across the horizon, Yuriko peacefully passes away. Jin honors her and then buries her. Sometime later, Jin, on his final assignment from Lord Shimura, is to visit Imugi Cove to seek out the pirate Goro. Jin speaks to the person in charge of Imugi Cove, a woman named Lady Sanjo. She tells Jin that he can go about his business in Imugi Cove so long as he doesn't cause trouble, and she also tells him where to find Goro. Jin tells Goro that he needs to repay his debt to Lord Shimura by delivering a message to the Shogun on the mainland. After obtaining a map, Jin travels to Lord Shimura's camp. Jin and Lord Shimura, along with some other men, travel to meet Goro at his boat. Problem is that in order to allow Goro to sail past the Mongol ships, they need to defend his boat. The samurai invade the nearby fort and commandeer siege weapons. 
Now, after defending Goro's boat, he can go and contact the Shogun on the mainland and deliver Lord Shimura's message. Then, after their success, Lord Shimura tells Jin that after the war, he wishes to adopt Jin as his son. This is also due to the fact that Lord Shimura doesn't have an heir and wants to make Jin his heir. He tells Jin that all they need to do now is wait for the reinforcements from the mainland and that when he's ready, to meet up at their staging camp. Getting there and speaking with Lord Shimura, it seems that they need to resolve another problem before the samurai reinforcements arrive. Lord Shimura has heard that Mongol forces, being led by none other than Ryuzo, are stationed at a fort called Fort Koyasan. Lord Shimura wants the fort retaken, as it will provide them an advantage in the fight to take back Castle Shimura. After Ryuzo escaped last time, this, in Jin's mind, is a chance for him to enact justice for Ryuzo's act of treachery. Naturally, Jin wants Yuna to go with him, but she refuses, stating that she's done, and that she wants to go to the mainland. Jin accepts. Taka, on the other hand, wants to help Jin, but Jin tells him no. Arriving at the fort, Taka has gone there anyway and says he wants to help as a distraction, and Jin allows it. Jin uses Taka's distraction and makes his way through the fort, and eventually comes across Ryuzo. As the two prepare to face off, Jin is knocked out from behind, and he wakes up having been tied to a pole. What's worse is that Taka has also been caught after he was tried to return to the fort after not finding Jin. What's even worse than that is that Koten Khan is there. He tells Jin the war can end if he tells his army to surrender. He tells Jin that he can be his second in command. Jin naturally refuses, and then Koten gives Taka a sword and orders him to kill Jin. Taka, thinking highly of Jin and how he'd do anything for him, chooses to try and kill the Khan. A grave mistake as Koten beheads Taka. Koten tells Jin that he'll just find another one of his friends and ask him to surrender again. Koten leaves and then Jin passes out. Later, after waking up, Jin gets free, obtains his gear and absolutely enraged, he fights his way to the courtyard, killing more of Ryuzo's straw hats. Yuna then shows up. Jin! Yuna. I just saw the Khan ride out with Ryuzo. Where's Taka? I know he's here. He left a message saying he'd followed you. Where is he? No. No! Like the ghost. You shouldn't have made him come! I tried to stop him. But he wanted to help. Jin and Yuna then battle and kill the last of the Straw Hats along with more Mongols. Jin helps Yuna bury her brother and they honour his legacy. Jin asks for her help in avenging Taka. Yuna says there's nothing for her anymore. Nothing left to do but fight. Jin then leaves Yuna to mourn her brother. Jin then travels once more to Lord Shimura's staging camp. The reinforcements from the mainland have arrived and they are ready to defeat Koten Khan and to retake Castle Shimura. Jin speaks with Lord Ogre of Clan Ogre and they escort Jin to Lord Shimura's location. Lord Shimura tells Jin that after the island is saved, he will become the heir to Clan Shimura. The samurai march onto Castle Shimura and begin to battle the Mongols. But then further into the castle, I will hold the line and draw their fire! Jin and Yuna then take control of the Watcher and end up using it to defeat large numbers of Mongols. After a long and bloody battle, the Mongols appear to be falling back, but in reality, it's a strategic play to get large numbers of samurai onto the bridge and to blow it up. Poor souls. We sent them to die. For 
nothing. We must honor their sacrifice. Gather our best soldiers. We will repair the bridge and attack at dawn. No. We've lost too many. If you had listened to me... Enough! There is another way. We will discuss it alone. The Mongols are on the defensive. We will strike before they regroup and end this war tomorrow. You sent our men to die. They are soldiers. Their blood is on our hands. I can find a way past the bridge. Poison the enemy. An act of terror. I am trying to save our people. By teaching them to fear us. If you continue down this path, you will be no better than the Mongols. I trained you to fight with honor. Honor died on the beach. The Khan deserves to suffer. You are ruled by your emotion. I sacrificed everything I knew to save our people. I gave them hope. You did nothing! No. We're finished. Jin speaks with Yuna and tells her to gather as much wolfbane poison as she can find. The plan is to poison the Mongols' milk and hopefully poison the Khan in the process. Jin, wearing some new armor that Taka made him, uses Taka's hook to traverse the destroyed remnants of the bridge and sneaks into the grounds of Castle Shimura. He sneaks through the Mongols into their camp and poisons the milk. One by one, the Mongols start to choke on their own blood. Jin heads towards the main keep in order to confront Koten Khan. Inside, he finds Ryuzo. Jin and Ryuzo fight one another again, and Jin prevails. Jin returns outside and meets up with Yuna. Lord Shimura arrives. He's disappointed to say the least. Jin tells Lord Shimura that the Khan left and was headed north, but Lord Shimura is more interested in the fact that Jin defied him. He defended us by spreading fear and chaos. We are at war, and you are acting like the enemy. This is not our way. Your way can't save our people. The Shogun will demand a head. But it does not have to be yours. I know she drove you to this. Uncle. Renounce the ghost. You must blame her for this outrage. Tell them. You are Jin Shimura, loyal servant to the Shogun. My heir. My son. I am not your son. I am the ghost. Jin is then taken prisoner by his uncle. A long time later, Kenji, the sake brewer, arrives and tells the guard that he's delivering sake as a thank you from Lord Shimura to the samurai for winning him back his castle. The guard leaves in order to partake, and Kenji breaks Jin out. Kenji says that if Jin stays there, Lord Shimura will ship him to the Shogun for judgment, as the orders came through that Jin is wanted by the Shogun. Kenji also reveals that Yuna is in the north of the island tracking the Khan. Jin tells Kenji to contact Norio, Sensei Shigawa and Lady Masako, and to get them to Omi Village. Kenji informs Jin of a damaged gate by which he can slip out of the castle. Jin escapes the castle and rides off on his horse, but at a cost. His horse takes a few arrows. It's a long ride to the north. Jin's horse does his best, but succumbs in the end and passes away. The area has been burned and sacked by the Mongols. 
Jin goes to the arranged meeting place, a sacred tree, to meet Yuna, but she's not there. Investigating further, Jin finds people that have been poisoned. The Mongols have learned how to craft its poison and are using it on the residents of Tsushima. Jin then gets shot by a Mongol archer, but it gets worse, it's a poisoned arrow. Jin attempts to lose the Mongols in the storm but collapses on the bridge, but he is saved by Yuna, again. After he recovers, Jin learns that the Khan has taken his army to a stronghold on the coast called Port Izumi. Jin tasks Yuna with trying to find a staging camp somewhere close. At the lookout tower, they spot the nearby Jogaku temple, which they could use for their staging camp. Jin and Yuna ride to it and defeat the Mongols there, whilst also freeing numerous monks being held hostage. Next, Yuna says that the road they need to access is blocked, and they need to defeat the Mongols at Ford Kaminodaki. But Yuna knows some hunters led by a man named Takeshi. Jin meets with Takeshi at the hunter's camp and offers him a proposition, whilst Yuna goes to Omi to meet with Jin's allies. If the hunters help Jin take the fort, Takeshi and his hunters can stay there in the warm fort until spring, safe from the bitter cold winter. Jin later meets up with Takeshi's hunters at the fort, and the group take out the Mongols. Hearing a Mongol horn near the southern gate, the group see an explosion. It was Yuna. They survey the bridge and see a Huacha they need to take out. Jin averts its fire by grappling underneath the bridge and takes the Huacha out. They then regroup with Yuna, Kenji, Sensei Ishigawa, Lady Masako and Norio, and they all defeat the remaining Mongols taking the fort. Yuna and Jin speak, and the next thing is to get everyone back to the temple and to plan their final attack on the Khan. Jin speaks to Yuna and she says they need a way to weaken Mongol defences. They travel to the port and go towards the lighthouse in order to survey the area. Inside the lighthouse though, they find loads of barrels filled with flowers, poison, enough to kill hundreds of people per barrel. Jin realises that the Khan will use the flowers against the mainland, so they cannot let the Khan leave Tsushima. Scouting Port Izumi, they spot an incoming storm that would work to their advantage. They spot a ridge that would be a great place to put a watcher. They decide the storm is their key to defeating the Khan. A plan is formulated for Yuna to procure a watcher, and a small army to distract the Mongols and for Jin to sneak inside Port Izumi and to kill the Khan. They then return to the temple to prepare. The following day, Jin says they simply need more fighters. Yuna knows exactly what Jin means, his uncle, along with the Shogun reinforcements, and she protests, saying that Lord Shimura will only end up throwing Jin in prison. But Jin has another idea. He, under cover of night, sneaks into Castle Shimura undetected, and leaves a note for his uncle in his private quarters, and then returns to the temple again. It's time to go after the Khan. They travel to Port Izumi. Lord Shimura hasn't turned up, but the plan needs to happen now. Jin and his allies defeat the Mongols whilst moving through a fishing village towards the port. Next, they join up with Norio. The plan is for everyone to draw the Mongols out and fight, whilst Jin sneaks up through the port to the Khan. Jin makes his way through and climbs a lookout tower, and he spots the Khan outside the port's manor house. Also, Lord Shimura has now arrived with his men. Jin finally confronts Koten Khan. All is death. Because you and your uncle would not surrender. I offered you peace, and you chose war. Now, the people of your mainland will suffer. You will never leave this island. Not wanting to take a beating, the Khan throws poison into the face of Jin. Jin defeats the two lackeys Koten Khan sent and runs after him. He's boarded his ship. Of course, Koten sends his men to try and kill Jin, so he doesn't have to fight him. Jin takes them all out, so the Khan, having had enough, is ready for his second beating of the evening. After a tense encounter, Jin dispatches the Khan. With the Khan dead, Jin and Yuna realise they still have a lot to do, given that the Mongols still remain on Tsushima, being led by various leaders, generals and captains. Jin also says that they can't stay there long, as his uncle will be looking for him. However, Yuna says that after the battle, he sent a messenger saying for Jin to meet him by the still waters of Omi Lake, under the red leaf tree. 
Jin then goes to meet with Lord Shimura. Jin. Uncle. I wasn't sure you would come. I wanted to talk with you. If we work together, we can drive off the remaining Mongols. Start rebuilding our home. That is not your duty. The Shogun has disbanded Clan Sakai. As of today, you are no longer samurai. I sacrificed everything for my people. And I would do it again. New samurai are coming to replace those we lost. They will occupy your land and estate. I have to say goodbye to my home. Ride with me. The two then ride to Jin's family cemetery. Lord Shimura says that he is to remain the Jito of Tsushima and to train the new samurai. I will miss this. So will I. The Shogun has declared you a traitor. He ordered you to kill me. The ghost was an outlaw. He taught our people to defy their leaders. To defend themselves. With poison, a gift you gave to our enemy. I had to stop you from throwing away our people's lives. You have no honor. And you are a slave to it. You are my son. Now I must continue the line of Shimura without you. I must start a new family. And my head is the cost. Taking it is my punishment. Final day together. I am ready. After their duel, Jin has a choice. To spare Lord Shimura, leading to him walking away, leaving Lord Shimura shamed, or to grant him his wish for an honourable death. Whatever Jin chooses Lord Shimura's fate to be, Jin is now an outcast and seen as a traitor in the eyes of the Shogun. But Jin still has much to do in liberating the island, given that the Mongols are essentially stuck there. The main story then ends. At some point on his journey, Jin was walking through the southern Toyotama region after hearing disturbing reports from a settlement named Drowned Man's Shore. After looking around, he finds signs that the peasants living there were driven insane. He soon finds out the cause. A group of Mongol soldiers appear, and they seem to be influenced by a Mongol shaman who is chanting, resulting in the soldiers becoming more ferocious. The shaman mentions someone called the Eagle, and that the Eagle is calling out for Jin. After defeating the soldiers, Jin talks with a dying shaman, who states that the eagle will bring her tribe from Iki Island, where they are currently based, to Tsushima. Yuna arrives and Jin reveals to her that his father actually died on Iki Island after the Jito at the time had ordered Iki Island to be pacified as it was teeming with pirates, raiders and criminals. Jin's father would therefore become known as the Butcher of Iki, meaning that the residents of Iki Island aren't really fond of not only the Sakai clan, but also of the samurai in general. For that reason, Jin, before his trip to find out what's going on on Iki Island, he must conceal the Sakai clan markings on his armour and replace it with the symbol of Yarikawa instead. Jin, along with his horse, boards the boat to Iki Island. The captain of the boat warns Jin that there have been severe storms around Iki Island since the Mongols started their invasion. True to what the captain said, a massive storm hits the ship, and after lightning strikes it, the boat becomes a shipwreck. Jin survives and makes it to the shore, 
and after moving through a cave, Jin finds that he is actually on Icky Island. Jin finds the remnants of the ship but can't see his horse, hoping to find it alive. Following the tracks, Jin sees Mongols trying to tame his horse, but it bolts, knocking a load of Mongols out of the way. Jin then catches up to his horse and calms him down. Jin then rides towards Ford Sakai, a stronghold that was created by Jin's father during the time he was pacifying Iki Island. Jin attempts to clear out the Mongol threat inside the fort, but they are too many and too strong. He is knocked out. He comes to being dragged to a tent. He is shackled and brought before the eagle. You the eagle. The scouts you sent to Tsushima. I killed them. Koten Khan is dead. We defeated his army on Tsushima. Tomorrow, a thousand samurai will join me on the shores of Iki. Surrender, and we will spare you. Your journey was hard. Drink? There are easier ways to kill me. I do not harm my guests. Sacred medicine. Save your strength. This is the easy part. You won't break me. You were broken long ago. I release your spirit to travel the underworld. Face the judgment of your ancestors. Jin snaps out of the brainwashed trance he was in and finds that Yuna is there to help. Jin also realises that the eagle poisoned him. Jin later sees a vision of his father, the Butcher of Iki, standing on the bodies of presumably the people he'd killed in his quest to pacify the island. The vision of his father guilt trips Jin, asking him why he didn't help him. Jin's whacked out state makes Yuna appear to be guilt tripping him too. It turns out that Jin was hallucinating Yuna being there, and then the eagle appears to Jin in her place and tells him that these visions are just the beginning and that soon fear and pain will overwhelm him. She offers to guide him through the horror and purge the guilt from his spirit. The eagle wants Jin's help defeating a group of raiders on the island and then Jin falls over the edge. He takes a journey through some caves as his younger self with his inner guilt tormenting him, haunted by the lives his father took. At the end of the hallucination, Jin is seemingly saved by a man who introduces himself as Tenzo. Jin was under the influence of a shaman. Jin gets some rest. Naturally, Tenzo asks Jin what a samurai is doing on Iki Island. Jin replies that after he killed the Eagle Scouts on Tsushima, and seeing what could potentially happen, he went to Iki Island. Tenzo learns that Jin drank the Eagle's poison, and that he is surprised that Jin is even still mentally functioning. Tenzo is one of the island's raiders. Naturally, Tenzo says that the raiders will not want to work alongside a samurai. Later on, Jin meets up with Tenzo again at a farm. They bury the people there who had been killed, and Tenzo reluctantly agrees to introduce him to the raiders so that Jin can help them get rid of the Mongols. After a quick trip round the cliffs, they arrive at the raiders' hideaway, and Tenzo introduces Jin to the leader of the raiders, a woman named Fune. Jin tells Fune about the potential threat of the eagle, and she allows Jin and Tenzo to work together. Fune's original plan was to take their boats and attack a Mongol warship. Jin tells her that's a terrible plan, and it's a good way to lose half of her men. He says that he can get aboard the ship himself and sink it. A plan is formulated in order to steal a Mongol supply ship and use that to board the warship. The plan goes well, with Jin taking out some Mongol cannons and the group of raiders take out the Mongols. They then head to the Mongol warship. When close, Jin, Tenzo and the raiders wait for the Mongols to board the ship and then they attack. The group takes out all the Mongols and board the warship 
and Jin sets some black powder alight. The raiders then watch the warship burn. Then they arrive back at the raider's den. Good work, Tenzo. I think Funo is going to be pleased. No. She's going to skin both of us alive. What are you talking about? You tell me! Lord Sakai. One whisper of your real name, and every person in this refuge will line up to split you wide open. Say my name. Force me to defend myself. This is what the Eagle wants. Samurai and Raider spilling each other's blood. She knows we're a threat if we work together. Bullshit! Who told you I was a Sakai? Was it the Mongol you interrogated? The Eagle wanted you to know. This is what I get for trusting a damn samurai. I grew up here, you know. Learned to swim in the shallows. Helped build half these homes. Broke my arm falling off the rock wall. Trying to impress my wife. You were married? Years ago. She didn't make it through childbirth. Fune helped me bury them. This is my home. These people are my family. If they find out I brought the butcher of Ikisan here, they'll stake both of us down. Make us a feast for the crabs. I won't let that happen. This stays between us. Yes, we're in this together. The eagle's hurting thanks to what we did today. We can save Iki Island if we stand together. But our fight is just beginning. <laughs> You, Samurai, and your speeches. I'll tell Fune your plan worked. When you're ready, I'm sure she'll want to thank you in person. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that. Be careful, Tenzo. And watch what you say. You too. Jin from Ryarikawa. Speaking with Fune again, it becomes clear that the Eagle is planning something else. Jin mentions that the Eagle has left Fort Sakai exposed and that the raiders could attack. The fort is a prison camp which holds some of the raiders, so Jin goes there and kills the guards and frees the prisoners. One of the prisoners tells Jin that the Eagle isn't there, but that she's left her lieutenant in charge, a Lieutenant Kunbish. Entering Fort Sakai with the raiders and after suffering more hallucinations, all the Mongols are defeated and all the prisoners are freed. Jin then comes face to face with Lieutenant Kunbish, who tells him that the Eagle has in mind for him to become one of her shamans. Jin and Kumbish face off. After taking a kicking, Kumbish runs off, but Jin runs after and defeats the lieutenant. Fort Sakai has now been liberated. Jin realizes that the Eagle knew that Jin would go there, and she left Kumbish to deliver her message. Speaking with Fune again, she reveals that her scouts recovered orders that the Eagle sent to a shaman. She wants Jin captured. Tenzo shows up and says that they were searching for the Eagle and stumbled across one of her patrols and tracked them to the cliffs outside the raider's hideout meaning that the eagle knows the raiders are close. A plan is cooked up to draw the Mongols away from the refuge and onto land, where they can fight them. They ride to Kidafure village, abandoned after Jin's father had a large number of the villagers killed. Haunted by hallucinations and reminders of his father's deeds, Jin joins the raiders in fighting the Mongols. It's a long, fierce battle, but the raiders are successful. Then Jin hears Tenzo say something. May your death benefit all beings. Jin? May your death benefit all beings. I've heard that before. From my father's killer. You're hearing things. It's the eagle's poison. Say the prayer for yourself before I end your life. Do it. On this blood-soaked ground where your father massacred hundreds. He was trying to save lives. You knew who I was, what you did to my father. You lied to my face. You lied to yourself. Your father was my enemy, not you. <laughs> How did someone so worthless defeat Kazuma Sasaki? I don't know, but luck. He, he slaughtered dozens of us before we brought him down. Broke his leg, I think. 
All I did was finish the job. Get on with it, Samurai! Not yet. You killed my father by luring us into an ambush at Senjo Gorge. That's how we're going to kill the Eagle. We need more than the two of us. Talk to Fune. And meet me near the canyons. We can't hide who you are anymore. But if I tell Fune... Do it. Tell her I'm Jin Sakai. She knows I fight for Iki. My actions prove it. Tell her I am not my father. If I was, you would be dead. So the plan is to ambush the eagle in the same way that Jin's father was ambushed years ago. Jin then meets up with Tenzo and Fune. The finer details of the plan are for Jin to provoke the eagle into chasing him into Senju Gorge, where the raiders will be waiting. More hallucinations plague Jin on the way to meet with Tenzo's scouts. Jin then spots the eagle. Jin fights her, but she wasn't even real, just another hallucination. They then realize the eagle is already at Senju Gorge, and they ride there. They fight lots more Mongols in the canyon, until finally Jin comes to the spot where his father died. The eagle tells Jin that the sacred medicine, the poison, brought him there in order for him to be healed. She says that the sacred medicine allows him to see his pain. Jin and the eagle then lock horns in battle. The eagle subjects Jin to more flashbacks. Jin, instead of doing nothing in saving his father, he this time knocks Tenzo out. This allows him to have a conversation with his father who tells him that what is necessary is sometimes terrible. He then gives Jin a sword and tells him to avoid the shame that their family suffered as a result of his defeat by killing Tenzo, but Jin refuses and snaps out of it. This was a way for Jin to embrace his past and to accept what's happened, to move past his father's death. Then Jin comes out victorious, mentally stronger, and mortally wounds the eagle. Before she passes, the eagle tells Jin that one day he will face the judgement of his ancestors. Iki Island, though, has been saved. Jin doesn't kill Tenzo, given that he's accepted the past and that he doesn't need to avenge his father. Heading back to the raider's hideout, Jin speaks with Fune and Tenzo, and just like Tsushima, there is still work to do in liberating the islands. People are still sick from the poison on Iki Island, and Tenzo will tend to them. Jin then returns to Tsushima to continue liberating his home, removing the Mongol threat, preventing it from rising up again. So now we'll look at the outcomes of the side quests of Sensei Ishigawa, Lady Masako, and Norio the Warrior Monk. Let's start with Sensei Ishikawa. You recall that Sensei Ishigawa had been betrayed by his former student Tomoe, who appears to have joined the Mongols. Meeting Sensei Ishigawa at his dojo again, he tells Jin that although Tomoe is not a samurai, she is a born killer. She is lethal. Over time, Jin and Sensei Ishigawa track Tomoe across the island of Tsushima. They find that she is not only allied with the Mongols, but she is in fact training them in the ways of samurai archery and had set up training camps. They also find out that Tomoe had promised to deliver the heads of Jin and Sensei Shikawa to the Khan. She also then had archers ambush the pair. Tomoe, wearing a kitsune fox mask, coaxes Jin into a chase and leads him to a cliffside. She jumps off the cliff into the sea and disappears. Sometime later, whilst in the northern region of Tsushima, Jin speaks to Sensei Ishikawa, who believes Tomoe is there. Whilst riding out to join Sensei Ishikawa later on, Jin comes across a Mongol convoy, destroyed, having been ambushed. Jin is approached by a woman. She says that she saw a man matching Sensei Ishikawa kill the Mongols, and that he told the woman he'd go to her house in the next day or two because the woman had food and fire. After helping the woman, who introduces herself as Matsu, check her snares for food, the woman leads Jin back to her home. You seem too kind to be the ghost. But the way you killed those Mongols... I do what I have to for Tsushima. The truth is... We are both survivors. We have darkness in us. If we didn't, we'd be dead. Sensei Shikawa said something similar. But it sounds more natural coming from you, Tomoe. Ishikawa always said I underestimate my opponents. I don't have an arrow in my back. Why not? The Mongols turned against me. After you trained them to slaughter our people. A mistake I tried to fix. But I can't kill all my archers. Not at all. You need me. And the sensei. But we don't need you. I know where they'll attack next. We can ambush them together. You get a victory, I get revenge. I'll talk it over with Sensei Shikawa. Jing. 
You can stay the night. No, Tomoe. Returning to Jugaku Temple again, Jin speaks with Sensei Ishigawa, who is annoyed that Jin didn't kill Tomoe. Sensei Ishigawa says that they shouldn't trust her, but nonetheless, Sensei Ishigawa agrees to go ahead with Tomoe's plan to wipe out her remaining archers. Meeting later at the Amugi border with Sensei Ishigawa, he and Jin ride to meet up with Tomoe. Your archers are planning an attack. Where and when? Umugi Cove. Heading there now. Why tell us? The Khan betrayed me. I'm taking my archers away. And if we don't help you stop them, they'll wipe out Umugi Cove. I don't believe you. Do nothing. And watch what happens. Damn it. The Mongols followed me. Jin, Sensei Ishigawa, and Tomoe avoid the ambush and take out all of the Mongols. No more traps, Tomoe. This wasn't a trap. She fought back against the Mongols, Sensei. To deceive us, so we lower our guard. If I want to put an arrow in you, there's nothing you can do to stop me. Enough. Umugi Cove could be under attack. We need to move. The trio defeat more Mongol patrols along with their archers. They take cover in a nearby grove. Tomori says that the Mongols are out in force hunting her. The group wait until nightfall and they sneak towards Amugi Cove. Fight with some more Mongols ensues and after defeating them, saving Amugi Cove, Jin and Sensei Ishigawa run to catch up to Tomori. A local man says he saw a woman matching Tomori's description heading towards the beach. She's trying to leave Tsushima. Wait. Sensei Ishikawa, we have judged each other harshly, but the Buddha tells us that our greatest enemies can be our best teachers. I am grateful for your teaching and for the chance to fight by your side. A final time, I have been your student. I would have become your daughter, but the way of the bow is behind me now. What lies ahead? I am like an arrow shot from a bow. Who knows where the wind will take me? It's over. Maybe she'll reach Kyoto after all. If she were anyone else, I'd say that's impossible. We still have a war to finish, a home to rebuild. I have no more lessons to give in this life, except one. Promise me, you won't repeat my mistakes. I promise, Sensei. Sensei Ishikawa's quest for vengeance is over. You recall that Jin found a list of co-conspirators and showed it to Lady Masako. The first conspirator on the list was a man named Sadao, a man who used to work for Clan Adachi, who was stealing rice for them for himself and was fired. Jin and Masako need to track down Sadao's brother Hachi, who runs a convoy for Sadao. They find Sadao's wife Hina instead. Masako and Jin want to question her but they get distracted and Hachi murders Hina before she can tell them anything. Hachi runs off but gets killed by Mongols and Jin and Masako find details of Hachi's supply routes. They finally corner Sadao at a lighthouse, but Masako loses her head and kills Sadao before he can tell them anything. Masako then goes to Komoda Beach to try and find her two sons who were killed there, and Jin joins her. She finds her sons hang from a tree by the Mongols, and she buries them. The next of the conspirators, Omura, was a supplier for Clan Adachi until he stole some of their supplies and tried to free Masako's son. Turns out that Omura is dead, but his two sons carried on his grudge. One of the sons provided the weapons for the massacre, and the other son blackmailed the leader of the conspiracy, wanting more money in exchange for their silence, and a meeting is set up. Jin and Masako manage to track the two brothers to Amugi Cove, to the meeting, but the two brothers are killed by the conspiracy leader's men. The next conspirator, Kajiwara, who was part of the clan until Masako kicked him out after he was caught beating his wife and daughter. Jin and Masako meet with a monk called Junshin, the monk who looks after the Golden Temple. Junshin won't tell Masako anything about Kajiwara, as he thinks she's just too angry and will do something stupid. He eventually says that Kajiwara lives on a beach. Jin and Masako go there and find Mongols there, 
and they've killed Kajiwara's wife and daughter. After catching up to Kajiwara though, it turns out that he killed his own family so that they wouldn't die to the Mongols, and then he fled. Masako is fuming and kills Kajiwara. Jin and Masako then put two and two together and surmise that all of the conspirators have had links to Clan Adachi at some point and had all been kicked out of the clan. Masako thinks that it's a rival samurai clan who are responsible. Later, Jin liberates a farmstead and meets with Junshin again. He tells Jin that Masako is there and she's searching for the final conspirator on the list, a woman named Mei, a former servant of Kanadachi. Now, Mei is actually a secret former lover of Masako. Mei was cast out from the clan after Masako's husband Harunobu caught Mei stealing and ordered her flogged. However, Masako stepped in and just had Mei banished instead. Although Masako did it out of love for Mei, Mei saw it as a betrayal. Mei is with a group of straw hats trying to sell a load of Adachi family heirlooms. Mei says she doesn't know who the lead conspirator is, but Mei mentions that they seem like they want to start their own clan and that they are directly related to Masako. Masako then lets Mei go. In the search for the lead conspirator, Jin finds Lady Masako questioning some monks. She thinks that Junshin the monk is connected to the conspiracy as she found a letter featuring similar handwriting to the lead conspirators. Jin is forced into protecting Junshin as Masako is intent on straight up killing him and the two duel. Not to the death, but enough to force Masako to calm down. They track Junshin again and he drops a bombshell. The letter he received was from Masako's older sister Hana. She is in fact alive, but also she is the lead conspirator. But why? Well, we'll get to that. Masako vows to hunt her sister down. Much later, to the north, Masako manages to find out that her sister has taken the Kikuchi estate for herself after Clan Kikuchi fell at Komoda Beach. Remember Masako recognised the emblem on the note Jin found? Well, that was the emblem, the emblem for Clan Kikuchi. On the way to the estate, Masako recalls during the massacre on Clan Adachi that Hana took the children to the stables, and Masako realises that her sister killed the children herself. Arriving, Hana appears to them and admits her guilt, but sends her men to kill Jin and Masako. Jin deals with the attackers, but Masako corners her sister in a room. She demands to know why Hana would do this to her family. You see, when she was young, Lady Masako fought off a group of bandits who attacked her family's estate. A samurai guard was there and came to her aid. This guard served under Haranobu Adachi. Hana liked Haranobu and she'd always dreamed of becoming the wife of a samurai, but Haranobu liked Masako. Then Masako married Haranobu. Hana was obviously jealous of Masako's achievements. Masako then arranged for her to be married to a man named Ikeda, an elite swordsman who was serving under Clan Kikuchi, and therefore Hana was moved out to live in the cold, distant region of Kamiyagata. Ikeda, despite being a noble man on the outside, was a drunk and abused Hana. Hana grew bitter towards Masako, seeing her as stealing the life she wanted for herself and forcing her out of the family estate. Therefore, using the Battle of Komoda Beach as cover, she gathered her co-conspirators and arranged the massacre which wiped out the rest of Kanadachi. Despite this, Masako refuses to kill her sister herself and instead gives her a tanto, which Hana uses to end herself. Masako then buries her sister out of respect. So after the news that the samurai had been defeated at the Battle of Komoda Beach, a small group of warrior monks rode south to fight the Mongols and got captured and imprisoned there at Fort Ito. Norio is presumed to be the only survivor of the group, which included his brother Enjo, and Norio harbours some survivor's guilt as a result. Norio asks for Jin's help and says that the remaining warrior monks can help Jin's cause. He says that they are within a day's ride. He says that he'll ride to a village named Akashima Village in order to support their healers. Among those healers is a monk called Hochi, their most skilled healer. They rescue Hochi and the other captured monks, but in response for it, the Mongols attack Akashima Village. The attack is thwarted, but Hochi is killed trying to defend Norio from a Mongol attacker. At Kushi Temple, Jin and Norio kill the Mongols there, but they find the monks there unwilling to fight the Mongols. Not only that, but the temple statue of Buddha has also been stolen. Jin and Norio find the statue and reclaim it, but the Mongols attack again, this time destroying the statue. After fending off the second Mongol attack, the monks become emboldened and want to fight. Sometime later, Norio finds that his brother Enjo isn't dead at all. Not quite yet, anyway. The Mongols kept him alive but cruelly cut off his arms and legs and burned him. Norio takes mercy on his brother and mercy kills him. But something has changed in Norio. He snapped. He learned that the Mongol responsible for the horrific treatment of his brother is a man named Kachu. Jin offers to help Norio attack Fort Shuni, the fort where Kachu is based. But Norio goes in alone and enraged whilst Jin is asleep and attacks the fort, burning it to the ground and brutally killing Kachu by burning him alive. Norio speaks of his regret that he got so blinded by anger and revenge. Jin tells Norio that he should honour his brother's legacy by leading the monks of Cedar Temple. 
Jin Sakai was born to parents Kazumasa, a samurai, and Chiyoko. Given his father being a samurai, Jin was raised in a disciplined household and was weaned onto the ways of what it meant to be a samurai from a young age. He was also trained by his uncle, Lord Shimura, who was his mother's brother. He had a friend, Ryuzo, and the two would fight, but still remained close. At some point in Jin's life, his mother became ill and died from the illness. Jin didn't take her death well, and at one point he went into the woods because he believed that she was there. He eventually got lost and wasn't found for three days until he was rescued by his father. After this, Jin was raised by his maid Yuriko and his uncle Lord Shimura. His father became distant due to the fact that after the death of Jin's mother, Kazumasa didn't know how to help Jin deal with it, and as a result, Kazumasa became even more devoted to his duty as a samurai. During this time, Kazumasa, it's implied, entered into a secret relationship with Jin's maid Yuriko, which is why Yuriko, in her confusion, kept thinking Jin was Kazumasa, and why she kept reminiscing about their nice times together. It was at or around this point that Kazumasa was ordered by the Jito at the time to pacify Iki Island. Failing in his duties as a father, Kazumasa took Jin to Iki Island, hoping to be an example to him during battle. Jin then got a polarizing view of his father due to the brutality of his father to the point where Kazumasa was nicknamed the Butcher of Iki. Then one day, Kazumasa got trapped by raiders in an ambush in Senju Gorge. Kazumasa broke his leg during the battle and Jin was hiding. Kazumasa called out for Jin to help him, but Jin was too scared to help, leading to his father being killed by Tenzo. Jin did nothing, and this would end up haunting him for years to come. His inaction would become a motivator for Jin to eventually become the best swordsman on the island. Jin would inherit his father's sword after his funeral, and then he would then be raised by his only remaining family, his uncle, Lord Shimura, who would usher Jin into the ways of the samurai. Lord Shimura taught Jin the code Bushido and trained him to fight. He also taught Jin how to hunt. But Jin didn't just become a samurai like that, he had to earn it. At one point in Jin's young life, he was pitted against his best friend Ryuzo in a tournament. The winner of their duel would become a samurai, and the loser would not. Jin won, and won in a very ferocious way which hurt Ryuzo, who over the years grew more bitter in regard to Jin, and would become a straw hat and a ronin mercenary, essentially the ronin are samurai without a master. Such was Jin's shame in failing to save his father, that he refused to wear his father's armour during the Battle of Komoda Beach, instead choosing to wear the standard armour of Clan Shimura. During Jin's journey in his defence of Tsushima, his father's spirit would be with him as the guiding wind, and the spirit of his mother would be with him as a yellow songbird. Alright, so in this final section we'll be looking at what actually happened during this point of history in feudal era Japan. Hopefully this will give us some context around the samurai, and what led the Mongol Empire to invade. So in Japan, the samurai itself rose to prominence over a long period of time, 1185 to 1333 AD, and they were essentially Japan's military force. They were led by the shogunate, and entrusted with the security of the estates, and they were protectors of the people of Japan. After the four-year-long Genpai War, a war between the Minamoto and Taira clans, which is thought to have ended with victory going to the Minamoto clan in 1185, this gave birth to the shogunate. The shogun in question, Minamoto no Yoritomo, appointed Jito, who were medieval stewards of land or territory in Japan. As you recall, Lord Shimura was the Jito over Tsushima. The shogun at the time the game takes place, in 1274, was the seventh shogunate, a man called Prince Koryasum, who ruled as the shogunate from 1266 until 1289. But anyway, on to the Mongols. The Mongols themselves were a group of people that came from the Mongolian plateau. They rose to prominence under the rule of the infamous Genghis Khan, who founded the Mongol Empire, which ended up amassing a huge amount of land for itself. The empire obliterated entire kingdoms, and the death toll was thought to have been as high as 40 million. Their military prowess was thought to have been outstanding. The reason for this was that soldiers were trained in the art of battle from a young age. You may be thinking 16, 17 years old. Nope, around 3 years old. They became the second largest empire in all of history, with the British Empire being the largest. The Mongol Empire conquered Russia, which at the time was an incredible feat. But the most impressive feat came in the Mongol Empire conquering freaking China. China was thought to have had the largest army in the world at the time, close to or even exceeding 1 million soldiers. But the Mongol Empire wiped out half of that army, which was serving under the Jin Dynasty, and they eventually conquered northern China. Years after the empire had conquered that part of China, Genghis Khan's grandson Kublai Khan had conquered the rest of it by 1279 AD after Genghis had died. It didn't end there, as well as China, Kublai also reigned over Mongolia and Korea too, and remember their empire also stretched all the way to Siberia too as well as Afghanistan. 
Then Kublai wanted to take Japan next, which leads us to the events of the game taking place during the invasion of Tsushima in 1274. It does need to be mentioned that Kublai Khan was mentioned in the game, in that his cousin was Koten Khan, the primary antagonist. But despite Genghis Khan having had many children and therefore grandchildren, there's no record of a Koten Khan ever existing, which means he was entirely fictional and created for the purpose of the story. In regard to the samurai clans, they were of course all fictional. The samurai clan who ruled over Tsushima, according to my research, was the So clan, and their leader, Sukukuni So, who according to history led around 80 samurai, died during the invasion along with all the other samurai. What's really, really interesting is that after the initial Mongol invasion, the Mongol army was actually beaten not by the samurai, but by a hurricane, which forced the Mongols to retreat back to Korea. I guess the developers used Jin as the representation of that exact hurricane. What's funny is that the Mongol Empire again tried to invade Tsushima a few years later, but were thwarted by yet another hurricane. But that is it for this Law & Order video. I hope you enjoyed this one, it took absolutely ages to do, so please reward my efforts by leaving a like and subscribing. If you want to support this channel's content then you can support me for as little as £1 a month over on Patreon. But for now take care, and I'll see you in the next one.